Misbelief is a book by Dan Ayerly talking about why rational people end up believing in irrational things. How could they end up falling for that? Now, he wrote this book after he advised a few governments on how what, what the best way to deal with COVID-19 is. Well, he is. He is a psychologist. He has a PhD. He's a full doctor and everything. And he advised some governments on how to best handle COVID-19 and the psychology of the public. So naturally, that means he's part of the Illuminati, which is what ended up happening. He ended up having a whole conspiracy theories made up about him, online attacks, people calling for him to be killed, etc. So with all that nonsense, he thought that might be enough material to make a book out of, which evidently it was. And he goes over some uh, very interesting key aspects of what it, what, how people who are normally fairly rational people end up having such irrational beliefs. And the, the content in here is, is actually very, very interesting. Uh, it's written in a very clear, concise manner so that someone who, you know, doesn't have a PhD could very easily understand in. Uh, the content of this book is, is something that I would like to uh, talk about in this exact video. Soon he became the target of conspiracy theorists, mobs of online self-righteous, delusional, self-proclaimed warriors of freedom, started accusing him of being a member of the Illuminati. He was linked to pedophile elite conspiracies, accused of being involved in mass murder, helping spread COVID-19, all manner of nonsense. Even got a few pictures of himself photoshopped in an SS uniform. Oh, and conspiring to keep children from their grandparents. And this is what led him to creating this book to better help understand why certain people fall for this kind of misinformation and how best to identify these signs in our own family and friends to try to help make sure they don't end up becoming the next Alex Jones, and then end up ostracizing themselves and then having all the negative effects that go along with this kind of mentality and the kind of life that it leads to. And, and that's the purpose of this video. Now, it's normal to be skeptical of information, or particularly in the kind of world that we live in now with social media and the mass abundance of false information that's put out there. So it is very healthy to be skeptical of the claims of not just people in power, but also the complete random nuts on the internet who go about either making things up or, or use different forms of cognitive dissonance to spread falsehoods because they genuinely do believe in them. But skepticism should be seen much like, uh, as Dr. Airely describes in the book, as like an immune system. It's good to have an immune system that will question things, uh, have you research them for yourself and discover for yourself, but it's quite another to have one that is reflexively dismissing of things that it doesn't want to hear or things that go against what it is that a person believes in. In other words, just reflexively getting rid of any information that doesn't conform to what it is they like. Such a kind of overactive immune system would end up attacking the body itself because it ends up going essentially too far into the point of irrationality. And that's the, the point that he makes here. It's healthy to be skeptical but it's not healthy to be automatic, like re reflexively distrusting of anything that disagrees with you. For example, we all know that big pharma and the news media have biases and agendas. That agenda is the profit motive. Yes, pharmaceutical companies are often exposed for ignoring health risks for medications. A f famous example of this kind of thinking was the AIDS contaminated hemophilia blood products that Bayer sold to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, knowing that it was contaminated. We know the mainstream media sensationalizes things in order to make news more interesting so that people will watch, boosting ad revenue. 
it's not a coincidence that there's more commercials on a 24-hour news channel during a dramatic breaking news stories or major events. We all know they're going to twist favors, twist events in favor of the institutions of power in a country. We need to look no further than the deliberate omission of important aspects of Israel's assault on Palestine. Now, it's easy for a conspiracy theorist to make a mistake, uh, to demonstrate a very clear cognitive bias that information they don't like or don't agree with is automatically dismissed. And they will not only take in information that they do agree with, but will make logical leaps in it in order to justify the worldview that they have. And they often misattributing certain events to causes which there's no evidence of, but they presuppose them to actually be true. Uh, now, here's an example of that. Fact one, in promoting COVID-19 security precautions, Dr. Airely advocated the image of protecting others over protecting yourself. He believed that it would be more successful than simply promoting the self. He was uh, advising more than one government to do this. Fact two, during COVID-19, he advised the U.S. Department of Education on the social stress of school closures and the psychological impacts it would have on students and parents. These two actual facts were then twisted together and falsely connected with other things in order to create his connection to a kind of conspiracy. The Department of Education wanted kids to wear masks so as to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. The people who believe that COVID-19 is a conspiracy think it's a plot to make their kids not be able to breathe and somehow suffer brain damage from reuptake of carbon dioxide, except that that's not an actual thing that happens. And he advised the U.S. Department of Education, so therefore he was the one who told them to poison their children. I know this is a complete non sequitur and it doesn't make any sense. And it's falsely attributing a policy which he had nothing to do with and didn't even advise them on. But you see how the, I was gonna say logical connection, but it's not a logical connection, but you can see how this actually works in their minds. We would call this a non sequitur, but out of interest here, it's understanding the cognitive process that's involved. It is not that these people are somehow inherently bad or inherently stupid. They're usually just very naive people that are trying to understand a large, complex situation that they're not prepared to do an analysis of. And this complex situation happens in a world that can be very frightening. Stress. Stress is a very major factor that people have to deal with, particularly with something as monumental and dangerous as COVID-19. And the kind of pressure that that stress puts on you would certainly affect your thinking. And there's probably a million uh, psychological studies out there that show the impacts that stress has on cognitive function and severely inhibits people's ability to make rational decisions. It's literally just being human. This isn't a, a plot or even a criticism of people. It's just a basic fact of being a, a human being. Now, when he talks about this stress, he talks about a three-step or a, a th three-hold effect that it does have on people. First, the general stress people feel, the overwhelming stress of having to live in and deal with a global health crisis. Not incidences like this that have, haven't occurred in our lifetime. Sure, they've, they've happened many times throughout history, but how many people alive that have experienced them? How many of the vast majority of the population have experienced them? Secondly, this stress is something much larger than us and our own lives. Something too large for us to handle as individuals. We feel a sense of helplessness due to its size and complexity. We are at the mercy of something we don't understand. We don't know how to deal with, and that's scary. Third, there comes a point when this stress builds up to a breaking point, when people are more likely to believe a false idea in the desire to gain some release from the stress. Just the perception of knowing the cause is enough to give people that adequate amount of release. 
Much of this can be seen in two particular types of stress that Dr. Airely outlines in this video, predictable and unpredictable stress. Predictable stress is the everyday pressure we feel throughout our lives. We know it's coming and we know how to handle it. A mother still has a ton of chores to do before she can go to bed, make lunches, vacuum the floor, put the kids to bed themselves. Family gatherings can be stressful. You know your uncle's going to drink too much and start complaining. But we know this is coming and we know how to handle it and probably have done it several times before. Unpredictable is just that. We don't see it coming. We know a tornado can hit our home and we know a terrorist attack might happen, but we don't really think it will. Predictable stress creates uncertainty about what is going to happen, how events are going to unfold. This makes it difficult for us to handle them to be sure everything is going to be okay. This uncertainty can be maddening. An easy explanation can be cathartic. This kind of stress, this unpredictable stress, is something that is very hard for people to, to deal with because it's not common, hence why it's unpredictable. And this can cause people to retreat into already held ideological positions and make them grip them even more tightly in a frightening situation, as we certainly saw with the 2008 global economic crisis. Sides became very, very polarized in understanding or trying to understand what happened and how vitriolic much of it did become. Now, this is a big part of what we would normally call falling down the rabbit hole and then end up creating all kinds of crazy ideas, getting involved in crazy people, etc. But Dr. Early puts it as a funnel, a series of degrees of things that are more likely to put someone into the conspiracy theory mindset, or he calls them misbelievers, as he was doing this kind of as a study and wanted to use neutral language. But I'm not doing a study, so I'm going to call them conspiracy theorists. So there are some very important aspects to this. Finding a villain can be very, very helpful for some people because much of this is stuff that we don't understand, stuff that is frankly beyond our ability as individuals to deal with. And then suddenly inventing a villain or even legitimately having a villain in mind for all of this makes it much easier because now you know what the cause is, or you, you think you know what the cause is, and now you have a target to put all of those confusing and painful emotions into. And because they are no longer like festering inside you with uncertainty the way they are, and that you can now focus them in a way, it makes them easier to deal with. The directionlessness that uh, a lot of people feel when in this powerless situation now begins to fade because there is a direction directly at the person it is that they believe is responsible for this. Now there's a person whom you can vent your frustrations and all those painful emotions onto. And that not only does that, but it also gives some people a sense of direction, somewhere that they can go, something that they can do, protest and demonize this one person or this, this, this villain in this situation that they feel is responsible. It also makes the situation or crisis easier to understand. COVID-19 was a complicated problem, which required a multitude of problem solving techniques and tactics to confront. You know, this isn't a wild, unexpected event that suddenly hit. It, it, it's to them, it's, it's a plot by a nefarious group of people. Well, now it's easy to understand. Now, unfortunately, as a result of this, uh, a bunch of people, uh, a great deal, many people have suddenly decided that they are now qualified virologists overnight, and they now know more than what the experts, people who have literally spent their entire lives gaining the knowledge in these fields, and thus conclude that they are lying to them, that this is the Dunning-Kruger effect, that a person with very little knowledge tends to overestimate how much they have. So by reading a couple of blog posts, they now believe that they essentially have a PhD and know better than the actual people who are trying to deal with the virus. Another effect is that they enjoy the hate. Hate is a powerful drug that makes people feel good about themselves. 
once it's harnessed, it elevates them from a simple-minded hater to self-righteous crusader. It feels good, virtue signaling to everyone about how great you are. In your mind, you've gone from lowly victim to hero of your own story. It's just the boost you need to stop feeling powerless and like a victim. At the same time, you get to virtue signal to everyone to, so that they see how great you are. Your ego soars as you accept praise from other conspiracy-minded people around you. Hey, it gives you motivation. It gives you strength. Exactly what you're lacking. By your perception that there is a conspiracy against you. But the perception that there's enemies lurking around every corner, a delusion created in their minds, getting some kind of relief is welcome. It often acts like a drug. No different than an analgesic when in pain. Eventually, they've victimized themselves so much that they need increasing doses of it. One must only look at the physiological responses of someone like Alex Jones to see how they dose themselves. Jones whips himself into such a fury, such a tremendous frenzy, and then that only the release of uh, declaring revenge can actually bring. Dr. Early outlines this process in what he calls a funnel, some somewhat akin to the term rabbit hole that is commonly used. However, his is based on an analysis rather than an analogy. Uh, his is a process that demonstrates how someone builds into this type of character, how they become to be a part of this in-crowd. He calls it the funnel of misbelief, a gradual process with uh, several influencing factors, emotional, cognitive, personality, and social element. Each of these is an element that makes up the process by which someone goes from being a perfectly rational, normal person to becoming a conspiracy theorist. And because of the widespread prevalence of this during COVID-19, it offered him a tremendous ability to be able to study it uh, almost basically in real time. But for now, we're just going to go over these four particular elements that do lead someone to become a conspiracy theorist. We are all human beings, and thus we are all susceptible to emotionally driven thinking. That's not a criticism. That's just the reality of being a human being. We're all guilty of this. At one point or another, we have all allowed emotional thinking to interfere with the way that we take in information and perceive it. That's not a, a criticism. That's life. During the research for his book, Dr. Airely spoke to a number of conspiracy theorists who believed him to be a member of the Illuminati and plotting to kill children with COVID-19 lies or another. He actually interviewed some of them over a Zoom call. Particularly fascinating was him interviewing a guy who not only wanted him dead, but straight out said he wanted to be the executioner. Now, needless to say, Dr. Airely described the encounter as not very productive, as one can imagine. Hate is a very powerful motivator. It has the power to change people's lives, usually not for the better, but you know, whatever gets you up in the morning, I guess. Because hate is such an extreme emotion, so powerful, it can easily overwhelm, override logical thinking, even simple cognitive functions. And how many times have you been mad at something and then tried to do a simple task only to end up making, you know, repeated simple mistakes? It's not just unhealthy for you, it clouds your judgment. And this, if having gone on for long enough, it can twist your whole personality into essentially being a whole different person. Now, Bill Maher did talk about this in one of his shows. And yes, I am aware that he is essentially a Zionist genocide defending piece of garbage. But what he says here about hate in America is frankly true. Abraham Lincoln said Americans were a people with malice toward none and charity for all. But if he had said it online, the first comment would be, blow me, Jew beard. <laughs> And the second would be, go to the theater and die. <laughs> I mean, look at this one. <laughs> really? Even cheesecake? What's next, calling apple pie a cunt? So, 
my question is why? Why? Why has hate become the national pastime? Yes, the technology does have something to do with it. But to those who say, oh, people were always horrible, we just have Twitter and Facebook now. No, no, not like this. The greatest generation had celebrities. No one would have thought to have sent Myrna Loy a telegram that said, fuck you, Myrna Loy. I hope Clark Gable gives you herpes. <laughs> Now, if he'd only become self-aware and realized that he was doing the same thing towards Muslims and Arabs in defending Israel's genocide of the Palestinian people. Cognition is essentially how people think, and the problems with cognition are inherent to every human being. No one is immune from this. It can distort the way we think, end up creating uh, either conscious or unconscious biases. And as I said, nobody is immune from this. Confirmation bias is the largest problem in the so-called research of conspiracy theorists. Now, they simply do not look at any information that would contradict what it is they've already decided is true. Any information you present them with is automatically dismissed as having been produced by those who are in on the conspiracy. Given such an inclination, it's no wonder that their research work is no work at all. Much of this is what's called motivated reasoning. Now, here's a good definition of it from the website Psychology Today. Human beings are not always, in fact, probably not often, the objective, rational creatures we like to think we are. In the past few decades, psychologists have demonstrated the many ways in which people deceive themselves in the process of reasoning. Cognitive faculties are a distinguishing feature of humanity, lifting mankind out of caves and enabling language, arts, and the sciences. Nevertheless, they're also rooted in, in and subject to the influence or biases by emotions or instincts. One of the most significant ways information, processing, and decision-making becomes warped is through motivated reasoning. When biased reasoning leads to a particular conclusion or decision, a process that often occurs outside conscious awareness. The Dunning-Kruger effect. I'm sure you've heard of this before. It's when someone assumes they know more than they do. Basically, having little knowledge in something makes you think you know a lot more than you do. On the other side, someone who knows a lot about something tends to underestimate how much they know. That the educated person is aware of how much they don't know. We see this all the time with doctors on social media correcting so-called health gurus telling you what not to eat. The educated person whips out their vast knowledge on something and the v-blogger knows nothing about. It's funny to watch, really. Just because you heard an explanation for something, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're correct, particularly if this person is pushing the idea of a conspiracy, that someone's trying to poison you with this whatever ingredient that's in your food. So naturally their substitute, which usually ends up being their own line of health products that they're hawking, isn't necessarily an actual solution or even actually a problem to begin with. It's good to question these people, particularly these people. Another issue is some people overtrust their intuition. When one is devoid of factual information, the gap is usually bridged by some kind of gut feeling. Often, it's hard to get all the information you need to make a determination on something scientific, especially when you don't have access to the scientific papers and research necessary. It's also important to add that essentially none of them have the ability to read such papers or studies. The mind, as it usually does, fills the gaps. Frustration can usually lead people to taking shortcuts particularly when they feel those shortcuts are justified. Oh, me? Well, I know I'm right. I know this is happening, so uh, I'm probably right in my assumption. While it can be useful in many situations, it is not a substitute for research. Uh, this is widespread for many of these kinds of groups. It should be noted that when someone suffers a great deal of stress, this invariably hinders their cognitive ability, their ability to really question or, and think things through. Like I said, this is just a, a part of being human. There are studies going back decades demonstrating that this phenomenon is actually true. So we can't just dump 
everything on these people and claiming them to be just simply dishonest or somehow inherently stupid. These kinds of weaknesses and inherent flaws in humanity itself are there. So they're not wholly at fault for a lot of the irrational thinking that they take on. No clear cut definition of the kind of personality that gets caught up in conspiracy theories. There are a series of similarities among those who do get involved in them. Merely having one of the personalities you know, doesn't mean that you are one, but it is important to note that those similarities when trying to determine the risk factor for someone. The largest personality trait for this kind of conspiracy theory thinking is narcissism. And to make things clear, this is the clinical definition that's given by the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, 5th edition. Has a pervasive pattern of grandiosity. Needs to be, and requires, excessive admiration. Has grandiose sense of self-importance, exaggerates achievements and talents. Expects to be recognized as superior without consumer achievements. Is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success. Has a sense of entitlement. Lacks empathy takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Dr. Early outlines how this exaggerated sense of self-importance tends to make the theorists prone to the belief that they cannot be wrong. Any analysis they make must be correct because to criticize it, you must be criticizing them. There's an inability to separate the self from the content they produce. If they write up a nonsense blog post that's clearly without merit, you simply cannot tell them it's wrong. To criticize the blog post is to wound them personally. Now, it should be obvious that this trait or behavior would tell you that the person is not operating, thinking, or dealing with any of this on a scientific basis. They very clearly are rejecting science in favor of their own ego. In my opinion, there also tends to be a persecution complex among theorists. Uh, whenever they describe an event or plot, they word it in terms of it being a conspiracy against them. In their minds, they've internalized what they've imagined in their own minds. The hidden thinking here is, I discovered it, so therefore it is about me. One does not have to be a narcissist to think this way. They need only a strong egocentrism. Egocentrism is the inability to differentiate between the self and other. But more specifically, it is the inability to accurately assume or understand any perspective other than their own. Although egocentrism and narcissism appear similar, they are not the same. A person who is egocentric believes that they are the center of attention, but does not receive gratification by one's own admiration. Both egoists and narcissists are people whose egos are greatly influenced by the approval of others. Well, for egocentrists, this may or may not be true. This is a tremendous problem for actual events which uh, do not involve a conspiring of some sort isn't about them. When a pharmaceutical company like Bayer ships out HIV contaminated hemophilia blood products, it isn't about this one guy on the internet that they're after. It's about making money instead of taking a loss. It's about the profit motive of those selling the tainted blood, not a plot against any particular conspiracy theorist. Dr. Airely says, Personality cannot be easily changed, but knowing which traits correlate with misbelief can help us identify risky points. Misbelief is not created in a vacuum, but it is sustained by one. The social role in the funnel is extremely powerful because it plays on our inherent need to be a part of the social group. All human beings are social creatures by our very nature. Being the opposite, opposed to social connections, is a sign of a disorder or at least some kind of disturbance. Keep in mind, we're not talking about people who prefer to have a lot of alone time. We're talking about genuinely antisocial people here. Once someone enters into a conspiracy theorist group, essentially all their regular social connections are replaced by people who are in that group. And that system is replaced by radical elements. And when that happens, it becomes very difficult to get someone to look outside of that particular bubble. Attraction to this group becomes quite strong when the behavior of the conspiracy theorist starts pushing them away from regular people who don't hold their emotionally charged false beliefs. This begins a process of ostracization, usually intentionally self-inflicted. 
this becomes impetus to move one's own social, social circle into the conspiracy sphere. This exacerbated if the person perceives themselves to be ostracized. This is when social maintenance happens, when a person is deeper down the funnel and having become embedded in the social group. Each person reinforces the other's false belief. No one is actually looking at contrasting information. Each person is wholly dedicated to seeking a confirmation bias, rational or not. The pressure to keep up the core of this social group is powerful. Any deviation from it is considered a threat. This is not like having a circle of friends where different members have different subjective opinions and can jokingly clash over them all the time. I have a friend who can best be described as a Jewish mystic, and we have some pretty fierce debates over religion, but we don't end up attacking each other. That's the difference. The result is each person reinforcing another by following strict guidelines on how the group is to operate and handle dissidents. This reinforces the funneling effect and making it harder for a person to leave. I hesitate to make the comparison, but this is similar to how a cult manages dissent and maintain, maintains cohesion. This is not to say conspiracy theorists are a cult, but much of their behavior is similar. Now, this is compounded by the need to belong and has an effect of causing the individual to double down on and aids beliefs for fear of being ostracized again, or first, depending. The need to show loyalty and gain status drives people to greater extremes and polarization accelerates this process. The fear of ostracization, a fear of losing some level of status, makes it difficult for someone to leave. There isn't a replacement social group waiting for them, as was the case of moving into the conspiracy theory social circle. This is why it's imperative to be there for family and friends uh, who get caught up in such groups, because you need to be there to offer them a social circle, social support, should they decide to try to leave. And this is particularly important if you do happen to notice a friend or family member who is beginning to go down that kind of rabbit hole. Now, before I end this video, I want to talk about some of the um, things that he lists as conspiracy theories in his, in his book and the studying about who tends to believe in what. Uh, there is a page here with a graph where a study was done where they mentioned a particular conspiracy theory and then asked people if they believed in it and then asked them what their political orientation was and then asked to see like who was what side liberal or conservative, which they falsely proclaimed liberal to be left when liberalism is a, is a right wing ideology. A very long argument there outside the scope of this video. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll use conservative and liberal. And some of them didn't really make much sense to me. Like I'm very surprised that someone who is on the liberal perspective would be tending more likely to believe that the moon landing was a hoax. And some of it did make a lot of sense. There was a very high liberal bias in believing that Trump is a Russian asset. And that does make a lot of sense to me. Some of them, however, were very surprisingly in the middle and that, you know, people, it wasn't a left or right thing, but apparently it was almost directly down the center that Holocaust deaths are exaggerated. The dangers of GMOs are being hidden. The true cure for cancer is being hidden. The Rothschild family controls the world. Fluoride in the water controls minds, or that regardless of elected governments, a single group controls the world. And then there are some that he lists as conspiracy theories, which really are not conspiracy theories. They're actually really quite obvious, like the idea that banks manipulate the economy for financial gain. Yeah, they very obviously do. You really only have to look at how many bankers end up inside of government, particularly working at the, uh, not just the, not just the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve is still answers to the federal government. The, the people from the banking industry being put in charge, like the, uh, like the, uh, the Department of the Economy, like the, the advisors for, for things like that. Etc. 
being, you know, Goldman Sachs actual people. You know, people who actually worked in the bank and did these manipulations in order to make money. Yes, the capitalist class manipulates the economy in order to make money. And those with the most amount of capital, those in capitalism, tend to wield the most power to do so. That's actually very quite obvious. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's literally just how capitalism functions. And he lists Jeffrey Epstein did commit suicide and that the belief that his death was a murder to cover up his criminal network was a conspiracy theory. There is no one who thinks Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide at all. That, despite what's in his book, I don't believe for a second is a left or a right issue. You would have to be pretty foolish to think that his death was actually suicide with all of the information that is available with the literally mainstream and non-mainstream sources reporting that the people who were supposed to be watching him mysteriously weren't looking when that happened. And the amount of danger that his prosecution would have to a lot of very, very wealthy people. I'm sorry, but believing Jeffrey Epstein actually did commit suicide is almost a conspiracy theory in itself. I think it was, it's really very obvious he was murdered. So I'm really going to have to disagree with him on that one. Now, regardless, Conspiracy theories are harmful for a society. They spread misinformation. They can tear families apart. They can destroy people's lives by taking them down completely idiotic rabbit holes that destroy their lives. I mean, how many people ended up essentially going bankrupt because they gave everything to Donald Trump because they thought he was going to take on whatever it is, particular conspiracy theory that they believed in. He was going to take on the global pedophile elites. He was going to take on the Democratic Party and whatever tremendous conspiracy that they have going on. So it, it is very important to fight conspiracy theories because, well, they are false and they are harmful to society, particularly when they turn into a bunch of nuts who storm the Capitol or people who go around shooting up schools or people who end up going around harassing the survivors and the families of people who died in school shootings. So it's important to keep these things in mind and that if you do happen to see a loved one or a friend start to go down that funnel to try to pull them out of it so that they maintain a, a very rational way of thinking. And I believe that was the point of this book to begin with. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.